I know you guys saw the title, hear me out. Anyone who can string a sentence together understands that the words we use on the day to day are meaningless. It's not to say words don't have any utility, otherwise written languages wouldn't be a thing and we'd be stuck grunting like the chimps we are. I'm saying words had no inherent meaning. Come on, what do you expect to call spelling a word that's predicated on the random sounds that comes out of anyone's mouth lined up with the matching letters that are also randomly chosen? Arbitrary maybe? Don't believe me? Then why is that spelled that way? Moving on. You know what the most ironic thing about language is? It matters. Surprise, surprise, I've cracked this confounding puzzle. Can I get my prize now, Mr. Dynamite Man? And whoever brings up the 93% of communication is nonverbal stat, just throw that shit in the trash. If that were the case, I can go up to a food truck, put two fingers up, and the owner should automatically know what I want. What is it, you ask? Well, wouldn't you like to know? I ain't hear you. Say that one more time. Hell, I could be flipping that guy off depending on where that food truck is. Anyway, back to the main topic. Despite the vibrations that travel from the larynx that get articulated by the mouth to make the arbitrary combination of sounds we call words, it's still the most effective form of communication. I mean, who's trying to play a long ass game of charades? But like a lot of things, there are a few problems with talking. Most of them come from poor word choice. Let's start with an example on the opposite side of the argument. What's the difference between an idiosyncrasy and a quirk? Aside from spelling, Nothing. No one who isn't a pedantic jackass will bat an eye if you use both words interchangeably. They both express the same idea, the peculiarities of a person's behavioral traits. If synonyms are used whatever conversation is being had, there should be little to no confusion. Now keeping that in mind, here's another example. Would you consider a town and a city the same thing and would use these terms interchangeably? The only thing they have in common is they are places where people live. Other than that, there are a world of differences between them, from the size, to the population, to the economic opportunities, and the list goes on and on. Although they are similar in that they are a type of settlement, there are too many differences to say that they are deeply synonymous. I mean, would you make a one-to-one -one comparison with a small town like Sedona, Arizona to a global city like the Big Apple? If the application of a word is off to some degree when compared to another, then expect conflation to be close by, and no other word is a better example of this when phenomenon than the word gaslight. It's the basic truth of the human condition that everybody lies. The only variable is about what. The funny thing about lying is everyone decries the action, but it's a very useful tool at everyone's disposal depending on the purpose. I don't care how cold-blooded someone is, no one's telling their granny that the sweater she made them for Christmas looked like Lee Harvey Oswald did his best impression of a Jackson Pollock painting on it. Everyone understands being on the business end of a lie sucks. It's embarrassing to be fooled by someone spreading falsehoods. Anyway, shout outs to the John who lied about being kidnapped, cause that was the best idea. Again, for an action that everyone decries, most of us lie on average twice a day, and in some cases have a bad lie day where all you say is nothing but cap. And that's just a regular day. It doesn't even mention anything about competitions. To win the games a chance like Blackjack or Texas Hold'em, the player must use any and every tactic available to outfox their opponents. Whether you put on a poker face or misrepresent the quality of your hand, any form of deception will do to win the pot. Hell ever had to let someone down easy because if you told them they had the facial structure of Quasimodo and the personality of a Tyler Perry villain, things would get sour? Honesty is the best policy until it becomes inconvenient. Although someone is in a disadvantageous position when being lied to because of how much time is wasted, at least most lies can be traced back to their origins. Remember back in 2008, the Quaker mascot got caught by the SEC for defrauding his customers out of $65 billion, marking it as history's largest Ponzi scheme? Mind you, that's when he got caught. Guess how long it took to break the game down and the year was deconstructed? Five minutes. It took this mathematical wizard, Harry Markopoulos, five minutes worth of number crunching to realize Madoff's returns were bullshit. About a decade before the SEC and they were notified on multiple occasions. Fucking dial-up was like seven years old at that time. You know you're gonna have to put up one of the morning, Johns. None of... Wait, matter of fact. And remember folks, there's being dishonest and then there's pulling strings. It's not personal, son. It's strictly business. What's life but an exercise in peer pressure? It's a social phenomenon that everyone's taught not to fall for, and if you do, you're weak-willed. But ironically, most people are followers. You listen to a band because everyone else likes their music? Poser. Copying someone else's fashion strategy to get the same attention? You clone. One of the homies hand you a spliff at a party? Well, guess who just couldn't say no, Trudy? Whether or not it's active or passive, peer pressure is a form of manipulation. A word with mostly negative connotations depending on the context. How could I say such a thing? Well, sit your ass down and I'll tell you why. You got the puppeteers pulling Pinocchio strings and you have n****s on the Wheaties box. Do Wheaties still exist? 
Who the fuck eats Wheaties in 2023? Breakfast of champions, more like edible sawdust for lumberjacks. Anyone who's a puppeteer is the classical manipulator. The plotter scheming in the background, constructing narratives that fit an outcome they desire. No one likes the puppeteer most of the time. But the important thing to understand is that you can still be manipulated by someone telling you the truth. It may be a story, but the best example comes from this Hadouken holding bastard. It's called the Rasen God. Is it blue and does it knock niggas back when it's supposed to? Well, yeah. Then why are you arguing? Naruto, well, in this case his edgy friend Sasuke, wasn't doing too well after he shot the fade with his brother Itachi. Well, what do you expect when you believe your big bro packed up everyone in the family without rhyme nor reason? And it doesn't help much when the same big bro helps you pull a snake man out your body. Bro, pause. Is that not what happened? Is that not what happened? So, as you can see, Sasuke's not feeling very cash money at this moment. Then his other family member, Mr. Gets No- <laughs> Zobito pops out of nowhere like The Undertaker and hits him with the truth. No filler. His brother didn't wipe out the Uchiha because he was a sociopathic dick. The village leadership instructed him to stop an Uchiha coup in the works unless he wanted his brother like everyone else packed up in what would be a large scale regional conflict. Guess what happens next? Sasuke swears vengeance on the leaf, which is what Obito counted on to get Sasuke under his influence. Because a relatively docile Sasuke puts a huge wrench in Obito's operation than that little ball of angst being out of control. An inconvenient truth did that. If that's too fictional, I don't know, throw a dart at a news channel, sit down and watch how the anchor or commentary presents the facts of the story. Now with the niggas on the Wheaties box, they're positive social influences. They're aspirational idols meant to inspire those within their respective fields to strive for greatness. Yeah, we know the actions of athletes or any high profile celebrity off the clock are morally unbecoming, but look at the effect they have on the people when they're at work. Anyone remember the Be Like Mike ad campaign in the early 90s? Three. That's enough, isn't it? Enough for you? <laughs> enough for you? No, it's never enough. Oh, okay. Never enough. Is, as long as you compete, you know, it's always great to win. That's why you compete. Okay. And I think uh, you know, yeah. we're going to certainly try to do this for the fourth time. You know, but right now, the third time was a lot of damn work. How many more are you going to go for? So as long as I'm playing. You know, I hate I, I hate to come short. You know, come up short when you've done it three times in a row. You know, I love to see us do it for the fourth time. There were three famous Michaels at that time. Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, Game 6, <laughs> and Batman. A hard worker and demanding leader in his own right, Jordan was a trailblazer during his time with the Bulls. The way he trained, the way he dominated both sides of the court, and how he pushed his teammates to strive for excellence made MJ the best candidate for Gatorade to bring him on as a spokesperson for a 91 ad after his first finals win. The highlights from the games he's played interlaced with kids playing a pickup game or two, copying his moves and the lines from the song Be Like Mike makes for one of the best sports commercials ever created. It's because MJ oozed these traits naturally, the commercial was so successful and from his overall basketball career inspired multiple generations of other players if not for his airness the black mamba wouldn't have found the answer for king james to claim the throne damn that was a f bar i need to write that down oh wait i can't find my pen and the tank's empty well time to head to the gas station oh and keep the lighter away we wouldn't want to start a fire So, we covered intentionally hiding your tracks by lying, controlling the strings to get what you want, or inspiring the future professionals in your industry with manipulation. Now it's time for the main event. Is everyone ready? I present thee with the word gaslight. Don't get too close, you might get burned. How do I describe a word with such flair, such danger for you, the viewer, to understand the weight of it? Well, remember the episode in Itachi's miniseries where he stared down Orochimaru and put him in a painful genjutsu? Yeah, yeah, that. With Genjutsu, the target's five senses are all at the mercy of the caster. In short, all I gotta do is look at you, and you're under my control. I can make it feel like you're getting jabbed with pointy pieces of metal. Change parts of your face to someone else's. If I really gotta do you dirty, put you in an infinite loop until you accept what's going on. But in the real world, nothing is happening. All the nightmarish images and pain you're experiencing, all in your head. A figment of your imagination, the world still turns while you slowly lose your mind. And sometimes, you don't get to walk out of it. Genjutsu puts the victim in a mental cage. A cage where very few people know that they're in, and even fewer know how to get themselves out. Now imagine being placed in a genjutsu constantly to the point where you can't tell the difference between up from down, left from right, or right from wrong. Anyone can fall for it and anyone can administer the poison. How? 
Let's pay attention to an almost 80 year old movie of the same name. A female opera singer named Paula follows the path of her late aunt who succumbed to a bad case of murder. Ten years after the unfortunate strangling, she grows up, marries her pianist Gregory Anton after a fortnight fling in Italy, and at his appeal but to her chagrin, moves back into the same house her aunt got packed up in. And from there, we fall down the rabbit hole. Throughout the film, Gregory is making every effort to undermine Paula's perception of reality. He starts out light by inferring that she's not feeling well and sets the expectation of his wife's temperament to his hired hands. What are you talking about? In like the first 12 to 20 minutes of the film, she's clearly distressed about ever setting foot back into London, let alone the place where her aunt died. And wouldn't it be a disservice to keep employees in the dark about the behavior traits of household members? You know what? You hit the nail right on the head. It's such a shame, really, how that's followed up with presenting negative traits Paula has never presented before. The same staff you warned is a poisoned well, which we'll get into in a bit, insinuate her lack of loyalty just for glancing at a guy, among other things, and proving the observation correct because your missus lost your family heirloom. I know it was here. I can't understand it. I couldn't have lost it. It must be here. I'm sure it's there. If you think that's bad, the Genjutsu only gets stronger from here. How? He also has Nancy and Elizabeth in on it without their knowledge. But there's a reason why. One's hard of hearing and the other one's Gregory's toad in the hole from all his flirting at the expense of his wife. You know, Nancy, it strikes me that you're not at all the kind of girl that your mistress should have for a housemaid. No, sir. She's not the only one in the house, is she? Let's add more fuel to the fire by calling both in, ask if either moved a painting, hear their obvious no, and have the mentally rattled wife find the painting in the same spot where it was moved in two separate occasions, before the aunt got packed up. So you knew where it was all the time. Golly, give Gregory an Akatsuki robe and a Slash Lee Village headband for the way he's casting these genjutsus. And where would all this intentional confusion be if we didn't throw in the bit of social isolation when Miss Thwaites tries to visit? You mean that old busybody from Akosa Square? Yes, sir. She has a nephew with her. Well, I don't think we need bore ourselves with them. Uh, tell her your mistress is not at home. My dear, if you let her in once, you'll always have her here. But she has called so many times, and we've never been at home to her. I do not want people all over this house! The gaslighting becomes so severe, Paula believes the footsteps she hears from the attic and the lights dimming from the lowered gas output are all in her head. Well... When you have a cook that can't hear well, a maid you feel at odds with because, frankly, there's another bad bitch in the house and the place ain't big enough for two, and you're not allowed to invite friends over, it really dulls your ability to interface with reality. Since she has no one to confirm her observations, she's practically trapped in an Izanami loop which goes like this. Here's a claim about her behavior or action. She denies it. Sees behavior or action come to pass. Loses a bit of her sanity. Rinse and repeat. Sorry if this explanation is a bit exhaustive, but it's important to get across how severe a case of gaslighting can become and how the film properly displays these tactics. The denial, the constant goalpost shifting, the lying, the use of others in the scheme, and the emotional switch-ups. Oh god, the emotional switch-ups. One minute Gregory tries to dissuade Paula from going to a reception, next he's apologetic and would like to join her after she initially puts her foot down. I didn't realize this party meant so much to you. Only to frame her for stealing his watch. Yo, Madara, if you need to sub out for Obito, I know somebody who could come off the bench. The only reason Gregory went out of his way to destroy Paula's sense of judgment is to give himself more breathing room, for you see, he's a bag chaser of the five finger discount variety, with Jules being Serge's his favorite thing. Oh, yeah, his real name is Serge's oh. Bauer. Dear Miss Alquist, I beg of you to see me just once more. I have followed you to London. It was written two days before she was murdered. Where did you find that? In this score, she must have left it there. It was written by somebody called Sergius Bauer. There was this dress her aunt wore decorated with four gemstones that caught the pianist's eye. So Sergius strangles her in hopes to make those stones his, but is surprised by an adolescent Paulo awoken by the commotion. So he runs off because, well, no face, no case. He bides this time for 10 years, which by then, Paula would have been in her early to mid 20s, which gives him the idea to seduce and marry her, bring her back to her aunt's home, mentally rattle her cage to the point where she might be committed to a psych ward, and walk out of the situation with some jewels in the house. It's not until Scotland Yard's detective Brian Cameron helps break Paula out of her mind prison by A, showing her the glove her aunt gifted him when he was a kid as a token of good faith because he was a fan, and B, point out the same observation she's made compelling her to dismantle all the tactics Gregory used to trap her. There's a lot to mention, so I'm just gonna list them right here. All of this culminates in a scene where Paula finally comes into her own as she throws all the BS back at her tormentor and finally breaks out of her genjutsu when she finds the brooch she lost earlier in the film. The same brooch that sent her into a downward spiral. 
There's no knife here. Yes, I put it there. Look. I don't see any knife. I put it there tonight. No, it isn't here. You must have dreamed you put it there. Are you suggesting that this is a knife I hold in my hand? Have you gone mad, my husband? Or is it I who am mad? I'm always losing things and hiding things, and I can never find them. I don't know where I put them. That was a knife, wasn't it? And I have lost it. Oh, I must look for it, mustn't I? If I don't find it, you'll put me in the madhouse. Perhaps it's behind this picture. Yes, it must be here. No. My brooch. The brooch I lost at the tower. If I were not mad, I could have helped you. Whatever you had done, I could have pitied and protected you. But because I am mad, I hate you. Because I am mad, I have betrayed you. And because I am mad, I'm rejoicing in my heart without a shred of pity, without a shred of regret, watching you go with glory in my heart. Now that we know what gaslighting is, let's talk about what it isn't. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. As poetic as that line is, thanks Willie has a comment on imbuing anything with any name so long as it still retains the characteristics that describe it, the problem crops up when one realizes that just with the rose, there's like 300 different species, and not every rose is of the same quality. Liars lie, manipulators manipulate, and gaslighters gaslight. Can you tell the difference between the three if they were in front of you? Just because all these behaviors are a way to control someone does not mean they are of the same degree of potency. Let's go full circle with this and bring back that completion formula. Every gaslighter lies and manipulates, but not every manipulator or liar gaslights. This may sound like I'm splitting hairs here, but this distinction is important to make. At least with liars and manipulators, the mark has some degree of autonomy whether to believe what they're hearing or do what the con man wants them to do. Gaslighting is a long con no one wants to be a part of. Like. Imagine the con man getting mad at you for falling for his drawn out scam. By the way, that MILF token they were back, I already told you guys don't buy that. I got paid a bag to do that. Yeah, it's that grimy. If these terms are allowed to be used interchangeably, then conversations on an interpersonal and professional level about the subject can get muddy. Take, for example, the last episode of the 17th season of The Bachelorette. Shut up! Going somewhere with this. The Bachelorette Katie Thurston rails against one of the contestants, Greg, for what she perceives as him being unappreciative of the attention she's given him throughout the season. Which, fair enough, but look at it from Greg's perspective from an episode prior. He was expecting her to verbally express the same feelings, but that never came. Since the competition was still going, Katie couldn't hard commit to this considering she had two more Bachelors in the running. Greg wasn't down with her holding back, so he opts to leave the competition, or the IRL version of leaving her on scene. It was never about the show for him. Like, this is real, this is real life. This isn't like how you told me, you already told my family I'm getting a rose this week. Like, f the rose. I don't give a f about the rose. I was just telling you, you filled a hole in my heart. It was always about the emotional sentiments that went unrequited during the hometown visit. When Katie cuts off Greg's apology, she replaced the phrase he used, talking down, with the term gaslighting because she believed it was a more appropriate word. I'm sorry, honestly, if you feel like I was talking down to you. I was Gaslighting, I think, is a probably a better word. In her definition, let's just say there's a lot to be desired. Gaslighting is when you try to make someone else feel like it's their fault. <laughs> Is that a female do- Before I continue, her anger is justified. Shit, if I got hit with a talk to the hand on national TV, I'd be pissed too. However, it doesn't excuse the misuse of the word. Just from evaluating Greg's actions, at worst, he's a selfish guilt tripper, a form of manipulation, but it's not gaslighting. The most accurate reading I could muster is that the dude poured his heart out and felt the love of his life wouldn't meet him where he was emotionally and expressed why he was upset with her, despite the outcome. Just because someone was compelled to feel bad doesn't mean they get to set the gas station to blaze. And considering that the season had an average viewership of over three and a half million people and the first time the audience hears the word comes from Katie giving an incorrect definition, that's not great for the discourse. In a well and good article, psychoanalyst Robin Stern, PhD, expresses how gaslighting is often used in an accusatory way when someone may just be insistent on something, or somebody may be trying to influence you, that's not what gaslighting is. So when it's generally invoked in today's world, a lot of people use it incorrectly. Instead of siphoning away at one sanity, turning the victim into a helpless vegetable, what we get when used in common parlance just becomes a false indictment on someone's character when they aren't exhibiting those behavioral traits which is counterproductive. Why? One. A spade is called a spade because it's meant for digging. A liar is called a liar because they're a dispenser of falsehoods. A puppeteer is a puppeteer because they control the movement of their puppet. 
There are better words that accurately describe a person or thing and their traits without having to turn a molehill into a mountain. And two, the gross misuse of the term can put a person in a gaslighting relationship in additional danger. The article continues, by adding in the noise of convoluted interpretations of what the term actually means, victims are less likely to be able to identify the gaslighting behavior they're subjected to. In other words, putting gaslighting through the linguistic meat grinder makes the word harder to access and understand for everyone, but most importantly, for those who need it to describe their own experience. To dilute the meaning of the word means those that need it the most to identify particular traits that best detail their experience has amounted to calling someone a doo-doo head. As a result, a word that once had strong connotations is now being used for sh like this. And now is me snapchatting other girls a problem? How is it a problem? How is it not a f***ing problem? How is yeah. it not a problem? Yeah. Yeah. You actually have a boyfriend. Oh like, I'm the side Oh my god. I have, I'm a, the, I'm I have a boyfriend. Stop. Oh, I have a boyfriend, but like, stop. Like, we're not talking about him right now, we're talking about you. No, you're crazy, you're not crazy. Stop calling me crazy, stop. Like, you're such a fucking narcissist. I'm a narcissist. Yes, you're full of yourself. How about You're me? full of yourself. I'm full of myself, but you want me to only talk to you while you can talk to other guys. Oh my god, you're having me, oh, you're looking stupid. Like, I actually I mean, look, look dumb. How do you look, like, how I do, look dumb. How do you look dumb when you have a boyfriend? That doesn't make sense. Because you're DMing, like, multiple bitches. <laughs> Okay. You're Snapchatting them, telling them this, that, and the third. Like, you what have, the hell? You have a boyfriend, so like, I, I'm, I'm. Oh my God! Stop bringing him up. You're over here trying to gaslight me. Despite how arbitrary the making of words is, it'd be foolish to allow any form of conflation to pass considering the damage they can do with gaslighting being the prime example. To lie means to take up an action that, although it's generally discouraged, even the most honest of us will use this tactic depending on the context. Manipulation with its negative connotations still breeds positive social influences that inspire future individuals to shoot for the top position that their leading figures of admiration hold. Gaslighting necessitates the active effort in distorting the realities of those who are caught in its torturous cage. Because people today misuse the term where other words would better fit the experience they're describing, it inevitably lessens its impact when uttered and leaves those who need it the most high and dry. If tomorrow were the last day everyone could speak, we'd all choose our words wisely. But hey, what do I know? Thank you for watching the video. If you like this type of content, give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Click on the bell to be notified on future uploads. Share the video anywhere and everywhere. And again, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next one.